Hello ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to today's webinar where we're looking at the three critical steps to optimize your SAP implementation. I'm delighted to say that I've got three gentlemen from uh, Nimbus joining me today on this speaker panel. Uh, many of you know I'm Susie West and I'm your chair for this session today and I'm the, um, the founder and CEO of SharedServicesLink.com. I'm joined by Kevin Jordan, Chris Green and David Easterbrook from Nimbus. So let's have a quick look at what the next 60 minutes holds for us. I'm going to touch on the importance of questions and then provide a little bit of context and then I'll be passing over to our three presenters for today. We'll then be closing today with questions. So just a quick reminder as to how our questions work. You have a um, question a box in your GoToWebinar panel. Please make sure that you utilize that as much as possible. Send me your question nice and early. And make sure that you really do get the answers that you're seeking from this investment of your time. The sooner you send me the question, the more likely it is it will be asked. I will put those questions to our three experts in the last 10 minutes of this webinar. So make sure that you stay on for that. Let's have a look at why we're actually having this debate today. When we do surveys to our membership um, of community, we often find that SAP is the most widely used ERP amongst our members. Often there's a penetration of between 60 and 70 percent. And it is generally assumed that the ERP investment of SAP is the biggest investment that finance makes within a generation. In addition to that, SAP is absolutely critical to the success of shared services and they're often rolled out very much um, in proximity with each other, either SAP first and then shared services or the other way around or often both hand in hand as a joint project. So they really are hand in glove as far as the success of the shared services is concerned. So there's a huge importance on SAP as far as the shared services um, market is concerned. Interestingly though, this investment is rarely maximized and we're going to be looking into exactly how the investment can be maximized in the next hour. So with all that in mind, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker from Nimbus, Kevin Jordan. Over to you please, Kevin. Thank you, Susie. Uh, good afternoon and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Jordan. I'm an account director for Nimbus uh, in Europe, and I work primarily with our ERP orientated customers. I'm joined today by David Easterbrook, who is the head of our solution consulting group. Uh, David has over 25 years experience of implementing ERP solutions uh, with end customers and has an awful lot of experience. And also Chris Green, who's one of our senior business consultants, who actually works on site with our customers every day, delivering what we're here to talk to, to you today about. Um, over a period of time, we've developed a methodology for working based around our application called Nimbus Control, which is a, bu a business process management application. We work with numerous ERP orientated customers, helping them deliver their projects on time and on budget. So today's agenda, first of all, we're just going to talk about some of the ERP challenges that the industry recognized in general, but also we've come across working with uh, various customers and various companies. We're then going to look at the methodology that we actually employ to face and overcome these challenges. This will be followed by an actual demonstration of, of how that actually works and how the software actually works, uh, followed by a, a summary of the, the challenges and the benefits of doing it this way, and then any questions you may have. So, the Standish Group, who specialise in looking at ERP projects and potential success and failure reasons, carried out a survey a little while ago, and they found some quite surprising results. Of the people they surveyed, on average, 182% of ERP projects ran over cost, and over 230%, sorry, and the time taken to deliver those ERP projects ran over by 230%. So they were costing twice as much to deliver and they were taking twice as long as expected. And the worst thing was, not only was it costing more and taking more time, but actually the business were getting much less than they expected from the new 
uh, ERP implementation. So we've worked with a number of customers for a period of time, quite a long period of time now, and we've actually identified with them some key project challenges that they face. And typically, key project challenges that our customers face tend to fall into to three key areas. The first one is poorly defined scope. If you haven't scoped your requirements, not just from a system perspective, but from a business perspective, at the beginning of the camp, at the beginning of the deployment or the beginning of the project, then you're more likely to face overrun and cost overrun. Also, the amount of time taken to actually capture and understand the new business requirements and process requirements for the ERP system takes far longer than it should. Um, many of our customers and companies we talk to nowadays are frustrated with having to parachute in external consultants for a very long period of time only to end up with very large documents that nobody can really understand properly are just a snapshot of moment in time of what they're trying to do that they have to sign off on. Um, and actually, process capture doesn't have to be that long. Uh, it can be done very quickly and very effectively. Finally, the executive team will sign off the ERP project. Uh, everyone will be very excited about it. Go live, they will come and there's no end user adoption. The end users don't buy in. And that's typically because there's a, a gulf between the team that's deploying the ERP system and the end users who are expected to use it. So it's very difficult to get user adoption and buy in. So again, ERP projects tend to uh, not succeed as much as well as they should do because the end users aren't actually bought into using the system. And at this point, what I'd like to do is just hand back to Susie, and I think we're going to do our first quick poll. So, Susie? Thank you very much indeed, Kevin. So, coming up on your screen now, which of these ERP project challenges causes you the most concern? You're very welcome, actually, to tick more than one option. Is it the poorly defined scope, time and cost needed to agree business processes and requirements, or is it lack of end-user buy-in and adoption, or potentially it's all of the above? So if you can tick the box or boxes most appropriate to your own situation, your own challenges as far as ERP project implementation are concerned, is it poorly defined scope, time and cost needed to agree business processes and requirements, lack of end user buy-in and adoption, or all of the above? Feel free to tick one or more boxes, closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results. 76% of you responded to this poll question, so thank you very much for that. We have, um, if we take away all of the above, it's um, the one that kind of uh, seems to be um, the biggest challenge for you is the time and cost needed to agree um, the business processes and requirements. So interesting results there. And Back to you please, Kevin. Thank you very much, Susie. That's extremely interesting to see that in a real-time snapshot poll. And actually, moving on from here, one of the things that traditionally people do around the capture of process, and this, this, this probably rings true for you. Do you recognize this? Process collaboration, process workshops. You get the subject matter experts and you get the, uh, the team leaders and, and the senior management in a room and you put up sheets of A3 paper, you put up post-it notes, you draw out a process and on the day, in the room, everyone gets excited. You've actually got them together, they've managed to put their view forward and together you've created, uh, albeit on the wall, you've created an a, a end-to-end process of how something should work. Now at this point things normally slow down and normally a week, two weeks later, those same people that were in the workshop that were excited and infused maybe receive uh, a, a diagram of some description, something to help them actually understand what it was you discussed. And what they did in the workshop and what they received on an email, usually two very different things and I'm sure that this process diagram uh, resonates with everybody on the call. Swim lanes, multiple colors, multiple shapes, um, and maybe even different standards for different parts of the process. And now this kind of process diagram is, is excellent for the small number of people within the organization that really understand business, business and system processes. But actually, for the wider audience, this is not very understandable. This is not something they can look at and easily say, okay, now I understand how we do that particular process. Now, this is actually from a recent customer of ours in Europe. They spent half a million euros 
um, to have external assistants come in and to define their end-to-end -end business processes for their e ERP deployment. And at the end of a, 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 a quite a lengthy engagement, they were presented with a 400-page document, and they were asked to sign that off. And they were asked to sign that off as the definitive of what they want to deliver from the ERP campaign. So they paid an awful lot of money for this document, and it raises some very serious questions. First of all, this is an end-to-end -end process that involves many different people in departments. How can one person be asked to sign it off? Um, how on earth does the project team actually use this document to actually go out and deploy their ERP system? And once the system's deployed, how, could you use, how can you use this document for end users to actually understand how to use the ERP system? How can you use this document to actually look at how you can improve the system? How can you use this in any kind of way, shape, or form as an ongoing reference manual? So, we have developed over a period of time a uh, methodology using our software to help companies tackle these issues, to help companies tackle how they scope a project, how they actually deliver that project, that ERP project, and again, by project, it could be anything from implementation, migration, consolidation, upgrade, and most importantly, how do they get adoption from the business users, the end users, and how do they make sure that they've got all of that in a format that is a single version of the truth, that is easy to understand, that can actually be used for ongoing improvement. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, David Easterbrook, who's going to talk through the methodology, and we'll then show you that methodology inside of Nimbus Control. Thank you, Kevin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I guess the first question here is very much why Scope Deliver Adopt and, and how we actually came to creating this approach for supporting our customers around ERP, in particular SAP. And I guess historically, um, ERP, ERP projects have been IT-led or have focused on software configuration, um, whereas the reality is True success is people delivering that value um, and gaining the benefits that you state up front. And so one of the real challenges has been how do you get IT and the business people in sales, in marketing, in finance, and HR all to be able to talk together in, in the same language. And that's where Nimbus Control really does come in uh, in its visualization of process and the ability to actually share process in a common, common way. Um, so very much for us, it's about how can we help customers get it right first time, because you don't have to go through the pain of creating content that's not valuable to everybody in the business that you can't use ongoing. Um, and one of the key points here is it's not just about system processes, it's beyond the system processes themselves. And if we look at this chart and, and say, if that represents all the activities in your organization, and we would split out how many of those are manual activities, how many of those are automated activities. The interesting thing is Gartner, SAP, Oracle all say it's about 80-20. Now clearly where organizations have heavily automated systems, maybe around manufacturing, it might be the other way around. But generally, it's 80% of activities in an organization are off-system, are manual activities. And the reality is most people focus 90% of their efforts on the automated bit. But the, the realization is that you're typically going from automated to manual processes. You're dipping in and out of, of them in any activities that you might perform during the course of, of, of a working day. And if you only were to focus on system and only to focus and spend 90% of your time on that, then you're going to get missed activities and therefore your processes will end up broken. And that's a very real reason why a lot of people fail with their projects initially because they haven't mapped everything. When people go live, they don't know the entirety of what they have to do. So we've come up working with our customers with this scope, deliver, adopt uh, approach, where on the scoping side of the project, the starting point is very much with a scoping workshop where we, we map the top level of the processes that are relevant. So it might be record to report, it might be procure to pay, it might be the HR processes. But we map that at a high level with, with one or two levels of detail in live workshops with different people in different parts of the organization. And that in itself, uh, with, a, with a big screen, is, is a great way of getting out the differences. So quite often, there's some great dynamics in those workshops. During those workshops, we typically capture either an added set of processes and at the same time, note to be requirements, 
or we map the 2B requirement and capture the difference between uh, what we'd like to be doing and what we're currently doing. So we're starting to manage change. Change management is a key part of any system upgrade, consolidation, implementation. But we also capture issues, risks, uh, business requirements, functional specifications at an activity level within, within the process model itself. And then when that's complete, we can conduct an end-to-end -end process walkthrough of those business processes before you've configured the software. Uh, now, it can happen afterwards, but the ideal point is before you've configured that software. And we've done that recently with a customer where they've had 10 different European countries involved. They then took those the subject matter experts agreed processes back in country, translated them, and, and then really started to collaborate with end users right at the level of people that use them in, in an operational way. And that proved a very effective way of, of defining scope right up front in the project. The next, the next phase here is, is very much around the delivery of the project, and it's about enriching those process diagrams with as much detail as you need to communicate to people. Um, so typically down to a, a work instruction level, or where you can attach work instructions to that lowest level of process, whatever works for you. But we add business controls, we add attachments, so it could be linked to other systems. It could be a link that launches an SAP transaction, so if you're going to raise a purchase order, then you, you can look at one of these diagrams and it will take you straight into that, that screen if you've got the, the, the relevant approval. We then can help create test scripts for end user training, um, for, for testing uh, the system itself, and help ensure that the process design matches the testing that you're doing. And then when you come to do the end user training, that matches the testing that matches the design. So you have that single version of the truth, and you have that integrity of information across all those areas. Historically, I've worked with companies that use Visio for design, Excel for test scripts, and Word for uh, end user training. And, and typically, those three documents are all different. So this really does help you save time and cost creating test scripts and end user training material. And then lastly, once we've got this done um, to the point where the software is configured, we have, we've done all the testing, the really great thing about this approach is that you've got ongoing use of that process documentation. So if I refer back to the, that document that um, Kevin showed us earlier, 400 pages, 500,000 euros to produce, um, that's that in the corner never to be used again. This is about using all of that information as valuable intellectual property of your organization in a single place to just that one version of the truth that you can operate uh, throughout the whole organization across Europe, across the globe. Um, one of the big benefits is the how-to guides, where you can actually ask questions of how do you do something. Um, so if you're using the system day in, day out, you probably don't need that. If you're using it infrequently, if you're a manager, you need to do an appraisal. This is a great way of finding out what the steps I do, and it will take me directly to the latest governed versions of documents I need to use. So it's a great way of managing and communicating change of providing feedback in a very collaborative way through the web and ensuring that processes are now effectively owned and managed by the business, not by IT, by business people who need to operate those, those processes themselves. So what we've developed to help customers as a starting point, and, and Chris will show us this in the demo following shortly, is a whole series of good practice business process content that every customer has been using, and you'll see a list of some of these customers shortly, uh, in the last three years. So procure to pay, order to cash, record to report, HR. We've got an overall model company framework, so it includes things like health and safety, um, ITIL and things like that. We've got project management approaches for ERP and PRINCE2 specifically, and ITIL processes themselves. And you can see on the, on the screen now, a, an example of a high-level procure-to-pay that typically starts off our process workshops uh, and have been used very effectively to speed up people's thinking and documentation of process. And to end with, the list here is of the scope, deliver, adopt approach and customers who have adopted that at various points. So the key message here is it's never too late to use Nimbus Control to help you deliver business solutions to, to, your, uh, to your customers. 
Uh, if we look at people like Sony, they had 28 different ways of working across Europe and they consolidated that for finance and for procurement into a single way of working using our software very successfully. They've then taken that to Japan and they're starting to look at that from a global basis. If we look at Worcester Bosch, they, they had already started their scoping, but they were struggling that their sales and their finance and their marketing people and their HR people didn't have a common view of what was going on. We went in, they implemented our software, and to quote their project manager, for the first time ever, everybody had a common view of what the process was. That was around uh, CRM in, in their case. And if we look at Adopt, Marathon Oil, they, they completed the software, but the business users didn't understand the software at all. And so we used them as control to create storyboards for them to understand the process uh, of, of what they were doing. And for their new project, they're about to start Funny enough, they're starting right at the beginning and they're using Nimbus Control for scoping. So a very effective way to use our software at any point, wherever you are in the project, to, to help and, and some real benefits from those customers. So I'm now going to pass you on to Chris Green, a Principal Solution Consultant, who will take you through what a workshop might look like. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kevin. Let me just show my screen. Okay. So I've got the best part of this, uh, this hour long WebEx. I get to show you how the tool or, or certain aspects of the tool help you capture your processes, help you enrich those processes with the business requirements, metrics, all, all that great information which goes as part of your requirements. Uh, and then I'm going to flip over to the actual end user experience. So I'll show you how people can collaborate throughout the project and post project and, and what that adoption can uh, look like. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off uh, with our, some of our accelerated content. What I've done is I've taken the procure to pay top level and this is, this is more common uh, the starting point for our workshops. So we, we can take a, a start of a 10 and with a group of people very quickly say, is this the correct scope of your process? We can, we can quickly update it, we can quickly change ads remove boxes and we can get very quickly get to that agreement. So first thing you'll notice, this is the end user, this is the methodology for our, uh, our uh, process mapping methodology. You can see we, we use boxes and lines. We keep it simple. You can see we've got inputs coming in. We then have an activity which is a verb and noun. So we're not mapping functions. This is create and authorize a requisition. It's not just requisitions. Uh, and it has a very meaningful output. So we don't just put the past tense of the activity, it really is what is bringing, what is the value of that activity. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'm going to create, we're going to, I'm going to demo a, or going to mock a uh, workshop. So you can imagine uh, the participants, obviously we can't open up the call uh, and have uh, dozens of people um, commenting. So I'll be, uh, I'll be a bit, I'll be talking to myself a bit, but that's fine. So we're going to create some lower level detail around create and authorize requisitions. Now what we've already got, by, by having this top level, we've already defined the scope for the lower levels of each of these activities. Because as I create the detail below, we can see that it brings in our scope. It brings in the inputs and it has our outputs. We know the exact boundaries that we're mapping to, which is immensely useful if you've got different streams going on, different groups of people, they know the exact boundaries of, the, of their responsibility. Not, not a small point there. So what we'll do is we'll create a few activities. Uh, and as we would in any workshop, we'd, we'd start by defining the scope, which is already there for us, but we would reconfirm it. Then we would look at creating some activities. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mock up a process. It might not be 100% accurate, but I'm sure it gives you enough to give you, give you the idea of how engaging these sessions can be. So someone might, might shout out, let's actually verify the approved suppliers. Great, that's an activity. And we're not worried about sequence at this point. We're getting, we're getting the information out of people's heads as, as it occurs to them. So they might say, actually, we, we have to validate the GL and, uh, and cost object. So quite a technical one, because we're, we're mapping technical and business and you know, human activities. Then actually some bright spark would shout out that we need to actually we need to 
enter requisition details. No small step. We're not going to have a requisition without that. And there may be more activities, but we, we wouldn't know at this point. So the next task is we would put our outputs on the tool. And the tools, just to take, take a couple of moments to, to um, explain, the tool is designed for workshops in mind. So everything I'm showing you is, is real time. It's on a big screen. It's, it's got 10 people around the room, which are key to that process. It's, it's got people from different countries. The, the workshops I was uh, facilitating last week had about uh, six different countries being represented in that room. So you can, immediately, you can imagine the importance of having clear language, no clutter, you know, actually making it very obvious what people are talking about. That's, that's ever so powerful when, uh, when you've got cross-country teams. So moving back on, we say, what are we getting out of box one? Well, that's quite a simple one. It's that we have our external supplier selected. Something we can measure. Yeah, it's not just that we've verified them, it's that we've selected the preferred supplier, or wh whatever the wording is which means more to you. What are we what are we doing here? Well, it's making sure we've got a valid uh, combination. Perfect. Enter, enter requisitions details. What's the, what's the final output of that? Well, it's the fact that we have a requisition saved. So I'm, not, I'm not dwelling too long, we'll, we'll move along quite quickly. So next thing we do is we hook up the sequence. So we've got supplier available to buyer, that, is, that triggers box one. Actually, actually it all goes into box one. So these are all aspects and we can, if we've got the processes which these come from, we can map those in. So I might just move this down, give myself a bit more space. They're all the triggers, that's, they're all the feeds into box one. External supplier selected, well that's when we enter our requisition details. Perfect. Requisition saved, well, that's when we validate the GL and cost objects. Valid combination, does that get us to a consolidated requisition? No. So we're validating the process as we go through. So actually, we're missing an activity of approve purchase work. requisition. And I do put the odd typo in to show it does have a spell check in. Uh, that's our final output, perfect. And we can say, great, that one hooks down, and we've got, very quickly, we've got a simple process appearing on the screen. We can change it, we can improve it, we can make sure it's valid for everyone in the, in the, uh, in the workshop, but, but it, it's, it, it, it's often that this quick. So once we have our process, we can put, the first task we will do is put some resources against it. So who has, who's actually responsible for these activities? So. We, we do that by putting the resource against the activity and we can choose from a central resource or we can choose from a, a local library. So already we're starting to consolidate, you know, use a, use a um, standard list of resources across all, uh, across all processes so we can say that's a requester. Actually, at that step, it's not just a requester, we also use SAP. So we put that on. We can say requester also enters the requisition details, SAP does that. Interestingly, box two is a, a system task. Yep. We want that to we want the system to be able to do that automatically. What why couldn't it? This is already part of our, our design requirements, uh, even at this level of detail. Uh, and then who um, who's responsible? To keep it simple, we'll just put an approver in at this point. Let's keep the speed going. And they also do that on SAP, or we want them to do it on SAP. I think this is our scoping. This is the business saying what we want to be able to do, both both system tasks and manual tasks. Great. So we have uh, we've got a process very quickly. We put some resources on there. What else can we do? We we often do uh, a metrics analysis on a um, on a diagram. We can put in simple terms in a workshop. We can put a placeholder against the activity. So we could say, actually, on here, we've got a metric link of uh, number of uh, rejected PRs. Just a simple metric, but it appears against in, in your diagram. When you have your system, when you go live, you can link that to the live metric and really bring it to life. But already, you're looking at a process and deciding what the metric should be from the process. That, that is very, very powerful. 
Next, we could we would then go through the uh, the um, the process of capturing our business requirements. So we can define. So we can come in. We can define the fields that we want to capture. I've just got a very simple example, but often they are simple because remembering this is a live workshop as well. We we need to keep the speed going. So we can come in and we can add what's the title, and it could be as simple as a list of preferred supplies. Yeah, and the fact is we we need a prioritized list of supplies. Group by region. I don't know. Whatever the business wants, yeah, at that point to be able to come up and do that activity uh, meaningfully. And that's attached to the activity. So very quickly, we've created a process. We've put resources against it, which can be reported against. Uh, we've got metrics against it, and we've started to enrich with some business requirements. All in a single workshop. Of course, it would take a bit, little bit longer if we had the, uh, the buy-in and the, um, the input from all the attendees. But it really is this simple. Because as we go up, we can then say, right, fine, we're, we're ready at that, that level. What's the next? We've got our scope, and it's, it's moving on. So other ways we can enrich the, the diagrams, actually under enter requisition details, we, we might actually want to put the, the SAP transaction link in there, or a link to a training site, or a document template, or an example of a filled out requisition. We can really enrich this for, for end users. Uh, so we could quite simply put in a uh, great PR, and I don't know what the code would be, but MA51N seems as good a one as any at this point. Click OK, click OK, and then we've got the link there again. So not only can people follow this process through, but they can start launching the resources, in this case SAP, that they're going to need to um, complete that action. Okay, so we've got a process. I'm going to now move over to the, the Nimbus Control web server. So this is the portal, this is the, the website which all users can access, but it's the, the way that end users will engage uh, with this content. So I want to take you, put you in the mind that we've, you know, we've been in the workshop, you've now left that workshop, you've, you've gone on your flight home, you've got back to the office, and you now want to engage with that content. You might want to socialize that around. So we can come into a, a web portal, this is the my workspace. This is this is Ian Gotz's workspace that's personalised for this user, which is built up depending on his role in the organisation. And you can see at this example, it's a it's a list of favourites. It's a list of processes which are important to me. It's a list of storyboards. I'll show you storyboards in a bit more context, or links, or or reports which are pulled out of the system, showing the information which is being captured in real time. Well, in chat transactions or, or metrics or scorecards, it really is a, well, a one-page screen showing me my, my portal to the, uh, to the company, to my processes. So if I click on here, we can see we've got our top level, we've got our drill down for all, what we've just been doing. So it's real time. The information is there as soon as it's created. So you can have people in different countries coming in, seeing it. Um, as Dave mentioned earlier, you can have them translated into different languages, so you can, you can really start to socialize the requirements, uh, processes and requirements, before you've even started to design a system. One of my customers at the moment is getting great value out of being able to just hold sessions or give people a user account, and they can go and, uh, and comment on the processes. So on that note, we can say, so it's not just about pushing information out to people, but we can also come in, we can in very quickly just add a memo and say, oh, I've got a question. What about tiered approval? Actually, we need some more detail around that, that approval, because actually we want to be able, the system to be able to approve uh, orders below 50 pounds. I, I don't know, whatever it is. But, but we can come in as an end user, we can then, we can then have our say which ripples through to the, when, you when you come to deploy the system, it, you've actually engaged and you're actually delivering what people want. It's not, it's not new to them. They understand that this is a process which they've had a say in, in creating. 
So obviously we've uh, we've taken a top level. We've only created a very small part of that. But what we can show you now is is our procure to play accelerator. So this is an example of how it can look and feel uh, a bit further down the line with, with a little bit more effort. And, and this, is, uh, this is how a lot of our customers digest process. So it's not about boxes and lines at this level. It's about the branding, the corporate branding, the images, it's the, the very simple entry, entry points for people. It's all built on a process. So just to flash up a, a good example of a built out procure to pay. So you can see we've got our create uh, authorization request. We've got our order goods and services. So if I was to click down on a different process, you can see here, and we, and we can drill down the level we require, so we can really start to build up a, a, a complete process architecture with no duplication, all the processes in the right place, owned by the right people. But as I navigate around here, I'm, I'm quite happy navigating around this, uh, this process architecture, but if I was an end user, dropping them into this framework, uh, there's hundreds of diagrams, could get quite confusing. And that's where storyboards come in. So I could quite quickly click on how to for buyers, and again, just one example of how it can look and feel. But if I now click on how do I requisition a non-stock item, I'm shown a storyboard. So this is a selection of the steps, very quick to produce once you've got your activities, once you've, once you've got your process. There's very little overhead in creating these for end users. Uh, and it's the same process. I just click through, we've got some, some additional notes, I've got all the access to all the links, so I can access the, the in this case, the SAP transaction through the storyboard. Any anything we've enriched it with, we can access through here, and I can click through. I can go straight to approve purchase requisition if that's what I need to do. But it's just a way of delivering that content to the you know, the right content to the right people, making it very easy for them to do the right thing. What I've also got on this. Uh, storyboard is an acknowledgement step at the end. So what this means is I've been set up as a person that needs to know about this, act, this, this new process, or I'm new to the process perhaps. So I have to log in, I have to put in my password to say yes, I've understood this process. So quite a, quite a small step, but quite powerful in, in A, gauging who's seen it, and B, B, seeing more importantly who hasn't, who doesn't agree with it. There's normally a reason, and it, it gives you the it gives you the details to go and find that out. Okay, so we've, I've shown you how to create a process, and, and this is really the, the intelligent operations manual that people are left with. So it gets great use throughout the project life cycle, but you, you, you've, t you've taught them how to, how to start to continually improve their process. So it, it drives going forward post, um, post ERP as well. So that's, um, that's what I um, intended to show you. Obviously, there's a lot more to the tool, but I've chosen the best bits which are relevant to, uh, to the topic. Happy to take questions at the end if I've gone over uh, something a bit too quickly. But I'd like to hand over, hand back to Kevin, and he'll do the, the wrap-up. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, like Chris said, that was uh, a very uh, comprehensive application and there's an awful lot we could show you so we just wanted to keep it to hopefully what would be the most obvious and applicable today. Um, before we go on to questions and answers I just want to go just to recap where we feel the four key benefits for employing the scope deliver and adopt methodology lie. The first one is in fast and accurate process capture. Um, we've heard quotes before that you can either do it slowly and do it right or you can do it fast and get it wrong. Well, we disagree. We actually believe you can do it fast and you can do it right. Uh, using our accelerated content, which we've touched on here, but we've actually developed good practice accelerated process content with numerous clients over many years, which is now available to all users of Nimbus software. We have over 137 good practice HR processes out of the box. Uh, we also have procure to pay, order to cash, and actually, these mean that you don't have to start a workshop with a blank screen. You can start with a predefined process and then adapt it to your requirements. And a good example of that is someone like, for example, BAE Systems. BAE Systems actually mapped their end-to-end -end finance processes on five different sites, five different sets of processes uh, in less than 40 days using the accelerated content. Serco mapped their global HR processes and signed them off in the US 
in less than um, 20 days, which they thought would, which was a project they thought would take significantly longer. So if you're looking at ways and methods of actually capturing the process quickly and accurately, using a software application like this that, that allows interaction in workshops coupled with the accelerated content can make it happen very quickly. The second key benefit we think using this methodology and application can bring you is a single version of the truth. So instead of having that document that sits on a shelf that no one ever reads, that no end user could ever understand, that the moment it's been printed is out of date, you have a live single version of your processes that everyone from process experts, subject matter experts through to end users can access and interact in. Now this means that not only can you make process usable to the end users and in shared services, your end customers if you want to, it also means that you can use it for real genuine business improvement uh, use. You can actually look how do we work today, this is the process of what we do today, how can we actually evolve this to work smarter and better as an organization. The third thing that we always say to customers is one of our key objectives ultimately, and we touched on it at the beginning uh, in terms of budget overrun and project overrun through things like scoping and, uh, and, and the business not understanding what you're trying to achieve and so on. One of our customers, Sony, said to us that as far as they're concerned, we provided the foundation for them to deliver their ERP and finance transformation project on time and to scope. So we're not going to sit here and say to you, we will make it happen on time and on scope, but we can provide the foundation to help you do that. And again, we are not a consulting organization. We have consultants like Chris who are there to support and assist our customers, but ultimately we want to get you to a position where you can own this in-house, you can do this yourself, and you actually own your own process and how you manage them. The final uh, benefit, that, the key benefit that we think we can help organizations with is a perfect legacy system. So whereas, like I said before, you have a document that sits on a shelf, that's not a legacy system. Um, a, a series of video diagrams on, a, on an internet is not a legacy system. A legacy system is where you have a live, real-time, up-to-date, easy to manage, easy to maintain, central, single version of the truth that everybody in the business can actually use for anything from training, uh, consolidation of new systems. If you're looking to bring new businesses into your organization, you need to match up processes. So it's a real live working tool that you can use for ongoing improvement. And those really are the four key benefits that we like to talk to our customers about when we're talking about how we can help with this methodology and with Nimbus software. So hopefully we're pretty much on time, I think. We've covered a lot off very quickly there. Um, so I think we're now moving to questions and answers. So I'll hand back to Susie for that. Obviously, we'll answer as many questions as we can today, but I'm sure Susie will also provide the opportunity for us to have more engaged, direct conversations if you want to understand any element of this in more detail. So thank you very much for your time. I'll hand back to Susie and uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin, and um, thank you to David and to Chris as well. Very interesting overview there. So thank you. Lots of questions coming through. Uh, make sure that you do post your question now. We've got a few minutes for them. So uh, just to kick off, in terms of um, the, 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 the person within the organization that typically sponsors this or signs it off gets it, who, who, who is that typical um, stakeholder that you look to engage as a priority and also my second question is who are the other stakeholders that can influence the adoption of Nimbus Control Solution or a solution like this? Okay Susie this is Kevin. Um, typically, uh, typically we engage primarily with the business side so we will engage with people such as business improvement directors, operation directors. That's traditionally when Nimbus has been. In terms of ERP, we're also heavily engaged with ERP program directors, ERP practice managers. It's very important to have uh, stakeholder sponsorship from the business side as well as from the, the IT side, because ultimately this, the implementation of an ERP system impacts the business. So um, it tends to be, like I say, it tends to be operations directors, tends to be process improvement people, uh, process improvement directors. Yeah, and, and typically, it's Dave here, um, process owners for all the key areas. So for, for ERP, that could be the finance side, call to report, um, procure to pay, order to cash, could be the sales side, could be HR as well. Uh, so have, 
not only have the sponsors but have process owners to own ultimately those decisions. So the bigger the implementation, the more countries, the more locations involved, you need somebody to say, this is how we're going to do it. Um, and that's another reason why those accelerators help, because it gives you that independent view that customers love. And they often say to us, we use, use that as the uh, to be process starting point. We're, we're finding at ShedServiceLink.com that a lot of shared services organizations are moving away from functional focus to process focus. Um, I, I take it that this is something that you are also seeing as an organization, and that this particular application, the solution, helps that development. Absolutely. Um, it, the, the bigger success we have is the process view, which, which is things like procure to pay, order to cash, um, and, and it cuts across the silos, as, as we call them, you know, the, the different department views. And, and if you like, those views can still exist through storyboards, but yes, more and more customers are becoming more process um, focused. And have, having those process owners is, for me, a, a critical success factor in, in implementing a shared services or implementing ERP generically. When you, um, when you actually implement uh, this application um, and, and you work with your clients on implementing it, um, how often do you, you find your clients are, are perhaps shocked and appalled by what, they're, by what what this actual kind of application is exposing to them and how perhaps dreadful their current process actually is? Um, <laughs> we, well, believe it or not, most of the people we initially engage with are in the same boat. Uh, the Word documents, Visio, uh, multiple versions of the truth, out of date, on the internet. Actually, different people in the same teams doing things different ways. And actually, the true extent of the horror, as you call it, um, is not normally obvious to them until they actually get everybody in a room and actually get them to agree what the single version of the truth is, what the single process is. Um, so it's, I, I wouldn't say horror, I'd say revelation. Um, is a better way of putting it. Very diplomatic way of putting it, <laughs> Kevin. Um, so um, it, it looks quite easy to create the requisition process. What skills are needed? Um, who typically would do this, and how is it all maintained? Okay, this is Chris. Uh, typically, there's not one way of doing it. So what we like to do is we can kick off the project. We can quickly show people and train people how how it works, but the but we can also bring into our skills around facilitation and mapping, really getting the best of it at the tool. But the best projects we work on is where we hand those skills very quickly to the, to the in-house team, if, if, that's, if that's available. Obviously, we'll, we'd happily do it if we, uh, if we needed to. Uh, different customers like to use it in different ways, and it depends on their timescales and, and, and the issues they're facing. We have, when, where customers have an immediate and urgent need, they may, in effect, want us to come in and actually very rapidly do it on their behalf. Um, because we can do it very quickly. And um, we're talking, you know, where everybody else talks months and years, we talk days and weeks. Um, what we do is very, very quick. But, but as I said before, we're not a consulting firm, so any customer that wants to engage in this and become self-sufficient and be able to do this and manage this themselves and own their own process and not have to rely on external sources owning it on their behalf, we can certainly get them to that point very quickly. So um, this particular application, it, just if you could clarify, is it software, is it SaaS based? Um, a question that I've got is, is implementation as simple as loading software to, into a user's environment and is the cost based on a seat license basis? Yeah, so basically the soft, it, it's a software application, um, so it's a, a standard software application. The accelerated content is included in that application uh, for no extra charge, um, so it's part and parcel of the software. And it can be deployed in a number of ways. It can be deployed as a cloud solution. So literally, we can turn it on and send you a log on. Um, or if you prefer to have it inside your own firewalls and on your own servers, we can do that. Installation of this software takes no more usually than one to two days tops. Um, if you have LDAP for sign-in, we can uh, synchronize with all of that so that you have single sign-on. We also have integrations into our applications. So we already integrate with SAP. We have an integration with SharePoint. And, and one of the things we touched on here is that a lot of our customers, the actual, the process owners know they're using Nimbus, but the actual end users interacting with the process don't even know it's called Nimbus. They, they basically brand it to their own organization. They sit inside of SharePoint perhaps, and, and it looks and feels like SharePoint. Um, and equally, we reference any documentation you have in systems like that. 
So we can deploy it in a cloud environment, we can deploy it in-house. Um, it, it is pretty quick and easy to install and, and get up and running. Good, thank you. Um, how long does it take to train the trainer approach um, to allow someone else to facilitate the session? Well, I mean, training you on the software is very quick and easy. You know, we can actually train somebody to use the software thoroughly within a day to two days. That's our normal training course. The, facilita the, the thing to understand about this is it's not just a piece of software, it's a methodology and a mindset. Whereas people traditionally look at process and think about diamonds and colors and more technical wording, you have to think in, in terms of inputs, outputs, um, verb, noun, who, why, what. So when you're facilitating the workshops, you need to, from day one, be thinking, how do we capture this in, in a language and a format that the end user is going to be able to understand as well, that the business is going to be able to understand as well. But again, for a lot of our customers, we'll come in, we'll be part of the initial engagement, part of the initial workshops, and in a very short space of time, those people that are trained on the software, they, they realize how to do it. I mean, again, we're talking days, not, not weeks or months. Okay, good. Um, is the application, um, can you run it on a Mac? Through, through the web, um, the answer is yes. So it runs, in fact, a number of our colleagues use, use Macs now, and you can access it through the web that way. Um, you, can, you can, through various VMware, um, you can run the client through a Mac. But it's uh, certainly, majority of people are viewing content through the web, so Mac's fine for that. Okay, good. And, and view it through an iPad as well. I, iPad, iPhone, we haven't really mentioned that. Okay. And we, have, we have apps for the iPad and the iPhone. And are they widely used by your clients, these, these apps on iPhones and, and, and iPads? The, well, uh, it's becoming more so. Um, a lot of the people that actually use the process and need to access it on a day-to-day -day basis are actually office-based for the most part, so they don't necessarily need to have mobile access. But we are actually seeing a definite increase in the number of mobile users. Yeah, big, big customers like Carphone Warehouse, they're, they're typically, as you'd expect, using it on iPads. Okay, I've got a, a question here. Um, a big issue is trying to keep process and ERP systems, um, especially SAP, post-project. So what level of integration is possible to keep the defined process and ERP system in sync, both during and after the project? I, I, I guess the best answer to that is it's in, in the storyboards that uh, Chris showed us earlier, that, that's what really keeps this, this system live. So there's, there's two very clear phases. There's, there's the mapping phase, uh, where in live workshops, as we saw, you're creating the content, um, and then using that for training. But it's, it's typically post go live. It, every time the system changes, it's, it all needs to be built in. People like Sony build it into the whole change management process. In fact, their, their vision globally now is to say any change they make, business change. Uh, be it system or business change, goes through a central point and they look at Nimbus control first. So I think it's building it into your change management process and using those storyboards as the way for training new people, um, tr training people on, on things they do infrequently. And that, that keeps the system ongoing and live. You mentioned that um, some t on occasions people don't even know the name of the application and such. Does that suggest that the portal can be completely bespoke. Absolutely, yeah. They, they, they always are. We brand them to the, the color scheme um, and to whatever brand name that people want to call it. So yeah, there's lots of stories where people talk to, to other people about this product we have, um, and, and it's, it's Nimbus, and yet they've never known it to be called Nimbus. How to okay. probably be the most common one. OK, good. And um, um, we've obviously talked about the the speed with which you do an implementation. Um, can you give a rough idea as to what a typical ROI period would actually look like? Uh, yeah, it's Kevin again here. Um, it, it varies from customer to cu customer, but actually it's always very short. Um, we actually have something called a business case builder that we can work through with a customer prior to any kind of project to actually work out which key areas they want to focus on. Because when you look at a new project, we don't necessarily look at a, a holocaustic kind of approach to doing everything in one hit. Normally, we'll look at a quick win process area, do that first, and then expand out from there. 
Um, so it's always it's always within a year. I mean, I know that's a very sort of ambiguous thing to say, but it's always very quick. We're not talking about a ten, you know, five year, ten year sort of investment stroke return. It's always very short term. And the, the business case builder that we give to customers that they do themselves can help them actually work out, you know, work that out in advance of doing anything. Okay, good. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. I'm afraid we're now out of time for questions, but that was very insightful indeed. Um, I'm sharing with you now uh, contact details for, for one of the presenters, Kevin Jordan, so feel free to email any questions to him or you have his contact number there should you wish to make direct contact with him. We, just so you know, we, we partner a lot with Nimbus and um, they're very, very popular with our, our clients and uh, the feedback that we've got from our, our membership base has always been very, very positive indeed, so I do urge you to, to follow up with them directly. Um, just to highlight to you, we've got uh, coming up um, over the next month two webinars, which I ask you to register for at your earliest convenience. And we've got three conferences coming up as well over the next few months. The one I'll highlight to you in particular is um, optimizing um, optimizing SAP for end-to-end -end financial processes taking place in London in September. Very pleased to say that Nimbus is our lead sponsor at that conference. So thank you very much to the gentleman from Nimbus. Thank you to you for your time and attention. And I look forward to welcoming you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>